Solution has normally to do with a change. You want to make some kind of change in your life. Something isn't going quite the way you want it to do, so you're going to resolve to do that. You're going to make a new direction, a fresh start. Um, you're going to kick out the new year with a new direction in your life. The problem with change is that it's tough. Most people have a response to change. What is it? When you try to introduce change at the workplace, what do most people respond? How do they respond? They, they resist it, right? There's a lot of resistance to change. And the number one response to why people resist change is because it's a fear of the unknown. That's the most common reason. It's a fear of getting out of their comfort zone, their habits, the way they know how to do things, something that they are comfortable in, they feel very confident in doing. And change brings in um, a new direction where maybe you don't feel quite as confident. We're creatures of habit, us humans, some people more so than others. I mean, think about it this morning, guys, when you went to shave. Everybody always shaves the exact same way, right? You ever try to just stop, maybe even putting your socks on? You always put on one sock at a time. What do you think about it? But if you ever do it differently, it just, it just really throws you off. Habits are like that. We get into those kind of habits, and it's tough to change. Another reason that people give to resistance to change is this fear of giving over control. We don't want to give over control. And change often requires us to give over some aspect of control because we're stepping out in a new area, something that's different to us. So we fear giving over control. Another reason people give is a fear of failure. You know, if I change, if I step out and make this new commitment, I mean, I could, I could fall on my face. If it's a new job, if it's a new um, area of ministry that God's called you to, there's always that possibility, that nagging voice that says, well, what if I can't do it? What if I fail? The bottom line to all of these things is it's fear. Fear is what keeps us from change. It's a great crippler in our lives as believers. As a Christian, it can keep us from growing. It keeps us from trusting fully what the Father has for us. It keeps us from moving forward to possess all that God has for you and I. He's great plans for us. And He wants us to move forward in that. But fear keeps us from doing that. You know it's a tool of the enemy? Fear is. He uses it quite effectively in our minds. But in 2 Timothy 1, 7, the scripture tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, has He? He's given us power, love, sound mind. That's the spirit of God in us, not fear. Power, love, and a sound mind. In other words, God wants to give us, He wants us each to have a courageous attitude about life, about our walk, to be courageous, trusting Him. But that's not easy. It's hard. It's hard walking in courage. Because it requires us to fully trust God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Maybe some of you in here are thinking, you know, the new year, I'm going to start getting into the Word more. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to memorize some Scripture. I encourage you to do that. Well, here's a good one to start out with. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Write that one down. If you want to say, I want to start memorizing Scripture, here's a good one for you. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall then direct your path. See, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now the hard part is, lean not on your own understanding, because we like to do that. We like to help God out, don't we? That's not what it says. It says lean on God completely. Then He will direct your path. God calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. You ever think of that phenomenon, faith? We studied it in our Wednesday night group. We were going through Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, says this about faith. Faith is the substance, think of that, the substance, something solid, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It seems contradictory, doesn't it? But that's really what faith is. It's been said that physical eyesight produces a conviction or evidence of the visible things, like this podium. I can see it. I can touch it. But faith is the organ which enables people to see and trust in the unseen. That's what faith is. And that's what God calls us to, 
to walk by that, and then daily to commit ourselves to doing that. Every day, it's a commitment. It's a free will commitment on our part. You ever think about that free will? God's given us free will. And you think, well, sometimes God would be easier if you didn't give me that. If you just, when I committed my life to you, I just kind of got on a railroad track and I didn't deviate. I was able to follow you. But God gives us free will because He wants a love relationship with you. He wants you to choose it freely, just like with your spouse. You know, you want them to love you freely, not forced. So that's why we have free will. So today, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 1. And I want to talk to you about the new year in the context of courage versus fear. How and why we are to walk as fearless followers of Jesus Christ. So, those are the scriptures we're going to be looking at today. Let's not go to that one quite yet, Jim. Let's keep that, that passage up there. So turn to Joshua chapter 1. If you're there already... We're going to be looking at the first 11 verses, and then we're going to set the context and the application. The Calvary Chapel, we like to just make sure that you understand the context of the Scripture that we're in. So Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, the Jordan River. You and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is given you to possess. Okay, let's turn the clock back 40 years from this point in time. Where were they? How did they get to this point, the children of Israel, where they're standing on the Jordan River? Well, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to lay a little context in here. If you go back about 40 years, God put it on Moses' heart. He heard the cry of his people. They were in bondage in Egypt, slaves to the Egyptian Pharaoh. God put it on Moses' heart. You, you guys know the story. He went back to Pharaoh and he told him to let God's people go. And he hardened his heart. And there were a series of plagues that were brought upon uh, the people of Egypt. And finally, God pronounced the final plague upon the people of Israel. So that, that plague we'll get into in just a moment. But... I want to look at the context as it applies to the Israelites and then how it applies to us. So hopefully everyone can see that here. You'll see for the Israelites it was an exodus. God redeems Israel. Now for us, for you and I, how does this apply to us? Well, our salvation. God redeems us. Very good picture of the children of Israel to us as believers. How does it take place? Next one. The Passover. That was the final plague. You recall? Moses pronounced a judgment from God that the firstborn of every household would die unless a perfect lamb without spot or blemish was sacrificed and the blood was put on the doorpost and the lentils. It's interesting how that makes a cross, isn't it? And then the, the judgment then would come over all of Egypt and every household that didn't do that, that didn't put their trust in that, the firstborn of every household would die. There would be a judgment of death. 
As a result of that, Pharaoh's heart was finally broken. He released his children, released God's children. From